Coming up on this week's show, a lost Sonic Kart game is found. A Nintendo Wii that fits in your pocket. And we chat to Intellivision veteran Dave Warhol. The Retro Owl podcast is brought to you each week with our wonderful friends at Bitmap Books. And you need to check out Sinclair ZX Spectrum, a visual compendium that is a stylish 304-page hardback book dedicated to the machine that defined an age of video gaming. You can check that out and lots more on their website at bitmapbooks.co.uk. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 275, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And a very warm welcome to this week's show where we reminisce about classic video games, the systems that we grew up playing, and take you behind the scenes and talk to the people who made it all happen. And that is what we do each week on this podcast. We bring you a special guest. Now, recently, I know you did a little bit of a redesign on our website, Ravi, and now if you go onto our homepage at theretrohour.com, you have a little scroll back. You can see pretty much a never-ending timeline of like 275 <laughs> podcasts. I was looking through the other day, my God, we've had some legends on this show. People like Nolan Bushnell, you know, one of the founders of the video games industry. Tom Kalinske, the former president of Sega of America. Al Alcorn, who made Pong. We've had some of our favourite YouTubers. We've had people wrote for magazines. Really, we try and bring you a full overview of all the people that came together to make this wonderful medium that is video games. It's it's mental, and it's mad to think that we're going to be hitting 3D. 3D? We're going to be hitting 300. <laughs> <laughs> the Retro Hour in 3D. We're going, we're going 3D, guys. Um, we're going 3D. So we're going to be hitting 300, and uh, that's just going to be absolutely insane. Like, that list is going to get longer. We, we've kind yeah. of shot ourselves in the foot, though, with 300, because we've had really big, big guests for episode 100 and 200, and even though we're 25 away, we're, we're panicking about it now, aren't we? We were talking about it yesterday. Like, we, we need somebody big. <laughs> like, yeah. Number 300. Uh, I'm, I'm going to try, try and get someone big. But, you know, it, it could just be the bloke from down the road who plays video <laughs> games. The milkman. Yeah. <laughs> I had a chat with the milkman. He's, in, he's into Atari, so we've got him on. <laughs> yeah, so if anyone lives in, like, you know, Beverly Hills and you live next door to um, maybe, like, you know, Brad Pitt's into video games or something and uh, you can get him on, please do give us a shout. <laughs> this week, though, we are going to continue bringing you fantastic guests. Now, I'm hoping that I don't sound too sleepy on this week's interview, because it's another one that we had to do at a really weird time of day. Um, I ended up doing this one solo because uh, Ravi was going to join me at midnight, but um, you ended up falling asleep. <laughs> I, I, I woke up You've with... You've just dropped a minute there, man. <laughs> I woke up with like two missed calls at like five in the morning. Like, what's going on? Oh, Jesus. Yeah. And I set this interview up as well. Um, it's with Dave Warhol. Was it a good one, Dan? It was really good. Yeah, I mean, it got to around 20 to midnight. I made myself a coffee and I texted you and you didn't reply. I thought, yeah, I'm going to be doing this one on my own. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it is a really good one. You guys are going to really enjoy this. Now, Dave Warhol, he is, he was part of what's known as the Blue Sky Rangers at Mattel. And they were kind of the original, I think it was about five of them, who um, were the guys, the main developers on the Intellivision. Now, obviously, we had um, Don Daglo on the show about a year ago, didn't we? Yeah. We kind of got the first part of the story, and he worked with Don. He actually went to um, college with Don, and then Don hired him at Mattel. And he made so many classic games there as well, including, like, you know, the futuristic chess game Mind Strike. He worked on that, um, a game called Thin Ice. They had a really interesting history, because that was kind of a, um, a port of a Data East arcade game that was originally called Disco Number no. 1 that was very politically incorrect, so they had to make that a bit more family-friendly. Then, I mean, he's also... As well as being a programmer, he's a composer and a sound designer. So he went on to work on the Commodore 64, founded his own company, Real Time Associates, then worked with LucasArts on games like Maniac Mansion, and he worked with Brian Moriarty on Loom as well. Then ended up doing stuff like at Funhouse on the NES and porting games like Cubit to the Game Boy. So he's had such a varied career. You know, I really struggled to cram this into like an hour long interview. I, when, when I first saw his credentials and stuff, I was thinking, wow, this guy, because he'd actually um, converted like MIDI to the games consoles. So, yeah. so MIDI was working on the NAS and stuff. And, uh, you know, the complexity of kind of having MIDI instruments. So the sound stuff really interests me as well. But it also sounds like he had a huge programming career so i'm gonna have to sit down and listen to this one and enjoy it 
But again, I mean, it's one of those interviews where, you know, in television, you're kind of going back to the earliest days of the, the home console era. And then, like I said, we kind of go in this interview all the way up to like, um, you know, the Game Boy and the Game Boy Advance as well. So you think about how much changed in like those two decades. It was such, such a formative time, wasn't it, for the industry? Yeah, like sometimes we get these guests on that are just in the Intellivision period or, or mm. just in the early period, but don't span out into the kind of later console or getting into the 16-bit or 32. Didn't he do some stuff on the Saturn as well? Yeah, because I mean, you kind of go into that era. And like I said, you know, he was working on um, doing video game music too. And by then, we were kind of getting into CD audio, so everything changed again. And Socks the Cat, he worked on that game too. That yeah, was uh... <laughs> that, that, that was a weird game because that was, yeah. that was a game about bill clinton's cat like the pre <laughs> the presidential cat and they turned... seen some things man <laughs> <laughs> and they turned it into a, a kind of like a, a full game but then it wasn't released and it, i think it was made in like obviously the 90s around the clinton period and then it ended up coming out in 2018 didn't it and it was a was it a nes title yeah, Super Nintendo, I believe that was on. Um, but yeah, like you said, again, just so many really interesting stories. And being able to talk to him about Loom, because, you know, the fact that he, he worked with Brian Moriarty on Loom, um, and that game, the audio is so important in that game, isn't it? You've played Loom before. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah, it's a tough game, but yeah, that yeah. whole audio kind of interface. And yeah. Yeah, so there's so much in this interview. You're really going to enjoy it. Our special guest, Dave Warhol, coming up on the Retro Hour podcast in around 20 minutes from now. Now, we've had a busy week. Um, start of the week, actually, spent, I think, a full afternoon messing around with a Raspberry Pi and uh, trying to connect IRC to Discord that we finally got working this weekend, didn't we? It's, 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 it was a combination of me and Dan's knowledge, which is Dan um, basically knows how I to I supervised. Like. Yeah, that, Joe, Joe, Joe acts confused. I, I supervised the group chat with thumbs up. <laughs> and uh, it was basically IRC Bridge that works, uh, meaning you can collect old internet relay chat to Discord. And Dan's running it off a tiny little Raspberry Pi in his room that's just sat there 24 hours running this bridge. But also we did a full cleanup on Discord because that's like the center of our community. And... Um, we had patrons been integrated into there, so they've got a private chat where they could chat about the early release of episodes as well as Twitch subs as well, which have been added on there. And we've got a nice bot now, Retro Ronnie, who goes around and uh, keeps order. Yes, I mean, the main reason we spent time doing this is, you know, I know a lot of people are into getting retro computers online these days. I mean, I look around my room, I got myself a, a Commodore 128 recently, um, and that works with the Commodore 64 Wi-Fi cards. Uh, Man, she had that on IRC, chatting in Discord to people in our Discord group via my Commodore 128. Or on their mobile phones, you know. <laughs> yeah, which is amazing. So if you've got a retro computer and uh, you want to join us in Discord, you can now do this via an old school IRC client. Um, IRC.freenode. Yeah, freenode. It's on freenode.net yeah. and uh, it's yeah. hashtag retro hour. Yes, yeah, so if you join us in there, that will automatically connect you to Discord and you can chat away. And we've got loads of stuff in there. We just nerd out about retro stuff. And of course, we do have a new channel in there as well, where you can submit any new stories that you might spot during the week that you think would be interesting for us to talk about. So it'd be nice to see you on Discord, either via Discord on your phone or your PC or your old school machine via IRC. Now, speaking of new stories, should we jump straight in? Because there's been lots of stories. Um, another one actually from my Discord channel. This is a lost Sonic karting game that's been found. Yeah, Keith submitted this one. Yeah, Keith submitted, like, I think half the show last week, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> so this one confused me because I thought when you were saying earlier today, like, oh, yeah, there's a, you know, Sonic kart, like, lost Sonic kart. I thought you meant, like, a Sonic cartridge, like a Sonic game cartridge has been found. Yep like a prototype. I was like, what? How do we not know about this? But it's not quite <laughs> quite that. This is a Sonic karting, go-karting game, isn't it? Sonic Kart 3DX, which came out in 2005 and is an exclusive mobile game to Sonic Calf in Japan, from what I understand. Yeah, this is Sonic Kart with a K. Yes, with a K. Yes. So, yeah, this was a mobile game that was hmm. for um, Sega's Sonic Cafe service it apparently was a mobile service that they ran only in japan mm. and again i mean i know you're a you know proper sonic fanboy joe have you ever heard of this before i feel so when you linked this to me i was like what i don't i don't remember this like but i had like i don't want to say a sense of deja vu but when i watched the footage of it i was like i'm sure i have seen this probably like 
you know, at one in the morning on like a top 10 unknown games, you know what I mean? Like yeah. list or something on like game sack or something like that. So I feel like I have definitely seen it before, but what I want to know is, so it's a mobile game, mobile phone game, which you use in the cafe. So I want to know how that works. Like whether like, you know, unless I'm getting my head around that wrong when it says mobile game, I'm not too sure. Uh, so. I think it's, it's that, that was the name of the gaming service. Oh, so yeah, it, it would be like a service that you'd sign up for monthly. Oh, okay. and, uh, like Xbox Live or something. Yeah. Sonic Cafe, which was Sega's. Uh... Oh, I see. So it's okay. Sorry, I thought it was like you went and sat down in the Sonic Cafe, like you know, and had your Sonic, your Sonic <laughs> Tails Burger. Because, because some listeners are probably agreeing with me here. Because when I went to Japan, there is a lot of that kind of stuff. You know, there's a Kirby Cafe, there's a pokemon calf there's you know a final fantasy restaurant so so i instantly assumed reading that i was like oh yeah yeah so you go sit in the sonic calf you know uh, robotnik serves you your dinner <laughs> you play on your phone on <laughs> sonic cart 3dx that's what i was thinking but joe's been daydreaming about this this I've morning i've been daydreaming you? about it so okay okay cool so it was but a mobile also, phone game it was it was in 2005 yeah so if you think about the the, the phones that were like popular in 2005 you had like the nokia n90 Mm. Uh, the Sony mm. Ericsson ones, yeah, yeah, uh, the it, Siemens it, one. So it's it's that kind of Java, Java based, uh, Java kind of not quite as good as a Game Boy Advance kind of graphics, isn't it? Yeah. So, but I tell you what, so it, it, it's quite primitive looking, and it looks incredibly difficult to steer, um, which I imagine it probably was because you're probably using a number pad. But I tell you what, the the soundtrack on it proper slaps. <laughs> like, mm. They've got a really really good soundtrack. It's it's interesting and, as well because it's it does look quite high quality like for for those Java games and mm. obviously being Sega they must have had a bit of a, a standard with it you know when some of those Java games were absolutely awful yeah and to me looking at the graphics on it I mean it's kind of you know obviously not quite as high resolution but it kind of reminds me a bit of like Saturn quality graphics oh do you think you see it reminds me of the you know some of those kind of like I mean it's probably yeah I guess it is a bit better but it sort of reminds me of some some of the you know, later Game Boy Advance kind of 3D games, you know, where they tried it on there. That's what it reminds me of. But yeah, I can see what you're saying. It's got that kind of like Sonic the Fighters, Sonic Jam kind of look to it. Um, yeah, and when you get close up as well, I mean, I'll, yeah. I'll link the video up in our show notes. There's around a, around five minutes into the video, the camera kind of moves around. And it kind of goes close up to Sonic as well. And it kind of mm-hmm. reminds me of, uh, you know, the camera angles in something like Sonic R. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so it's a bit, yeah, I mean, the, yeah, the quite impressive for a mobile phone game of the era. I think I think Sonic the 3D model of Sonic's a bit rubbish, but um, the actual road and like the background and surface uh, all seems to run quite well. But I guess this is also played in an emulator. Like we haven't seen it played on a phone, and I think it would probably be de- <laughs> dependent yeah. on your phone's processor. Well. <laughs> About five frames per second potentially yeah. <laughs> on your phone or something. But yeah, it's interesting. But like I say, the, the steering on it looks a little bit awkward and stuff. But it's cool to see these kind of like lost games and stuff like that. You know refound if you will yeah and i think you know again it's just because sonic is such a legendary series mm. i mean if this wasn't a sonic game no one would care about it you know yeah. all these years later but um yeah <laughs> next, it's interesting to see next time i come around dan rather than you getting out sonic racing transformed you're going to pull out some say sonic kart 3dx for us to play <laughs> <laughs> and it'll be the best day of your life <laughs> Well, next time you do come round, Joe, you can put your Wii in your pocket because um, <laughs> have you heard about this? This is a pocket-sized Nintendo Wii. Now, this is an article on Hackaday, and you know Hackaday is one of our favourite websites. This is a website where they, they just show really cool projects, um, homebrew stuff that people have done. And uh, someone has actually done this. They've transformed the Nintendo Wii into um, essentially something that looks like a, a Nintendo DS. Yeah, so I, I saw this. So this has been done by a guy called um, Stoned Edge, um, a YouTuber who's made this. And now, apparently this has been, you know, in the making for a, the best part of a year he's been making this. So essentially started out as him 3D printing what is essentially a Game Boy Advance SP kind of shell. Yeah. Which is kind of like the precursor to the DS, you know. It's, you yeah, know, that square kind of look. That square kind of look, yeah. Because the Wii, I mean, I'm not a technical guy, but the Wii's PCB is quite condensed anyway, apparently. And then essentially got it in this 3D printed Game Boy Advance SP. Um, and it looks smooth, man. It, it looks really, really good. But what I, what I kind of spotted on it, obviously, is that he's emulating on it. Is He's emulating the GameCube on it as well, which, um, you know, obviously, because the, the Wii could play GameCube games, which I thought was really interesting. So I thought this was quite up Ravi's, 
Ravi Street, to be honest, with the emulation and stuff. Yeah, like. so this has been done before, but um, it's been done in an Altoids tin. I don't know if you know mm. what Altoids are. They're like they're like sweets, aren't they? Mints like in America, mints, yeah, I think. Yeah. yeah. And hackers always put stuff in Altoids tins, but this one's been done really nicely. Like, um, it's actually a thing called uh, we trimming, and they've they've worked out. Um, we've covered this before, but uh, this is a more complete kind of beautiful version of it um yeah they've, they've worked out that you can trim absolutely everything off the board like okay you don't need the power controllers in there you don't need the gamecube adapters in there you don't need all of this so you can trim it down to the bare essentials mm-hmm. and you can put another pcb in there mm-hmm. which um controls the power and does all of that so so it, it's still driven by the essential element yeah. which is that part of the motherboard but you've shrunk it down to fit into this case and i think the the great thing about this is he's made this plastic uh well it's acrylic case actually and he's yeah uh, he's he's see he's, yeah. he's, he's actually cnc milled this one so it's it's cut out um in the acrylic which is uh, an idea for when i'm making my amiga laptop i'm looking at this going oh <laughs> it, it really reminds me of that late 90s like game boy pocket look you know when they all had the crystal clear you know clam oh, the sh- frosted look the frosted yeah. shells yeah, yeah. Like, that. like it really reminds me of that so it's got that real kind of 90s nostalgic look because he's got it, it he's got it sandblasted as well so the acrylic's yeah. actually been sandblasted to achieve that kind of frosting so mm-hmm. you know he's proper put some effort into this and yeah uh the screen's quite nice as well and just the the interface for the buttons looks really good and uh, he's got little kind of speaker bays in there what what makes me laugh is while he's you know playing it i watched the video and he's playing it He's, he's not playing too well on Mario Kart while he's like narrating. And he's like, oh, I'm no gamer. And I'm just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> he's I'm a no hardware gamer, but... guy, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess he's a hardware guy and he's done it as a, like a, a pet project kind of thing. But it just made me laugh. He's like, oh, I'm no gamer. And I was like, oh, I beg to differ with what you've just made, mate. But <laughs> Well, I think it's, it's a bit like an arms race. So before they were like, let's make the smallest we possible. Yeah. Now it's like, let's make the nicest, most presentable small Wii. Yeah, exactly. Because I was going to say, there, there has been smaller Wiis, hasn't there? But this is kind of like one of the nicest ones we've ever seen, which has been condensed. I can relate as well to what you said then, you know, the, the fact that he said he's not a gamer. I mean, I sometimes, I'll spend like a weekend setting up an emulation machine <laughs> just for the fun of doing it. And then everything's all installed. I'm like, right, bored of that now in the cupboard. Don't play it. So sometimes it is just the fun of doing yeah. it, I guess, isn't it? I really, really want an arcade one up. But it's just like, I'll make it. It's the fun of making it, playing it a couple of times and then just being like, oh, look, at it. it's there in the corner of my room, but probably not play it every single day like it's intended to be. Tinkering, tinkering, that's it. Yeah, tinkering. That's it, yeah, yeah, that's it. Uh, but this as well, I mean, it's cool. You can put all the other uh, Wii and GameCube CD images, the ISO files on an SD card in here as well. So, I mean, you've got, you think of the, the entire library of the Wii and the GameCube mm-hmm. together yeah. on a little handheld. I mean, God, that's a lot of games that you can take around in your pocket. Although, can you actually play motion games on this? I don't think you can. I, I wasn't going to bring it up, but I don't. I can't imagine you can play motion games on it because of. I don't think. Got, yeah, he hasn't got the infrared sensor. In he's there. not Maybe. got the infrared sensor on it, and obviously no Wiimotes. Can you imagine like taking it on the train? If it did work, you take it on like a train or a plane or something, and you're all kind of like sitting around, gathering around that tiny little like four inch screen with your Wii remotes, <laughs> trying to play like Wii Sports or something. Standing in the aisle trying to do bowling. Yeah. <laughs> I can imagine, see, that could get you fit on the way to work. You're on the bus, you put your Wii Fit board down in the aisle. <laughs> He's missing a trick here, I think. Playing so, the boxing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, we love anything like this, you know, really creative ways of using our systems. So, uh, yeah, we'll link that up if you want to read more about it and everything else we talk about in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, something that's been trending all over, I've seen loads of my favourite YouTubers covering this device over the last week. I know uh, Modern Vintage Gaming did a video on it. Adam Korolik did one as well. This is a device called the Retro Tink, um, which is a device that they say could be the ultimate retro system upscaler. Now, what is an upscaler, first of all, Ravi? Uh, upscaler, um, I'm, I'm going to get this totally wrong, but I guess it upscales the images. <laughs> what it does <laughs> is uh, it kind of improves your image and does lots of fancy things to um, get it in the best resolution possible. So I think this device is going to be really good for Joe. 
especially with the inputs, because uh, we know Joe was just using composite before. This one uh, displays component and composite like in the has it got best. an rf port though <laughs> i think it has it shows an RF. Yeah, yeah, oh, oh, oh brilliant there we go <laughs> yeah it's got s video as well rgb and scart so you can have all of them input which i think is really useful and it's just plug and play straight away there's no setting up or anything like that comparing it like mvg did a fantastic video comparing it to the other devices um, mm. it's, it's not the best, but it's got some nice features. So it's $275 that is at the moment. So oh. it's, it's still a bit pricey, but if you think if, if you had all your different retro systems, you could use them on this. If you had some kind of fancy switching device, I know Dan bought one the other day, didn't you? So you could have all your, all your composite inputs and then switch through them. Yeah. Mine's just a cheapy one that I use on, a. Uh on a CRT monitor. But I guess the reason you want something like this is to use it with your modern TV because, you know, old school consoles haven't got an HDMI. Yeah, yeah, but also 4K. So, like, PlayStation 2, you can you can put into uh, uh, 1200p, which is, like, higher than 1080p. Mm. And um, what it does is, uh, th- this RetroTINK, it's, it's amazingly fast at switching between inputs. So, you know, like when you're, you're playing one game and then the mode switches into another one, Something sometimes it's really slow. Yeah. Like if you're using one of these other upscalers and, uh, you know, you're going from a cutscene and then suddenly it goes into loading the game and it's a different resolution. So that switch yeah. is incredibly fast on this. But also interlace signal, which was, you know, when you had like seven... 20p and then you've got or oh, 1080 1080p and 1080i i mm. is the interlace signal and um the kind of display of the interlace signal is beautiful on this like i've not seen anything look as nice as that like um the amiga did uh these high resolution interlace modes as well and this thing oh it just looks stunning and you know usually you get a bit of flicker with that interlace as well. This really reduces the flicker. So it's got this kind of motion detection, which means uh, areas without motion and stuff aren't flickering as hard. And uh, that kind of old interlace signal really gets cleaned up. And then if you're upscaling it, it, it just looks really beautiful. So it's it's quite a nice device. I'd like to see um, more on it and stuff. There is a lot of videos, but you know, uh, similar units would probably be the frame meister and uh that's really expensive and getting rare now and requires tons of setting up and then the ossc but that's that's more of a doubler i think uh mm. i've not i've not used an ossc though you've got a frame meister haven't you yeah yeah and uh yeah uh, th- you need to change it from japanese download um, profiles put them in an sd load individual it's a nightmare mate you know this just plug and play looks great that's what i need plug and play yeah well that's it i mean i know you joe you actually use your retro systems on not not a brand new tv yeah um, but you've got a tv that you know it's an hd television you use mm. it on isn't it that does still have rf probably yeah. the last one in the world I that was made I can't with get RF rid of this t- my wife has tried <laughs> to get me to get rid of it a few times because it's you know, it's like a 42 inch, but it's massive because it's got like a massive six inch border around it because it's probably that like 2009 or something TV. But yeah, yeah. it has got an RF and HDMI on it. So and SCART. And, and SCART and everything. Yeah. So yeah. so the Retro Tink 5X with it being plug and play because of I'm not a smart guy. You know, I, I wouldn't be able to mess around with a frame master like Ravi does. This would be perfect for me. But, you know, obviously $275 is just taking that hit, isn't it, to... Yeah, and, and also having like S video and stuff. I don't think mm. uh, the OSSC has S video. And that, you know, as time goes on, that is becoming more of an issue because, I mean, I'll be honest, I prefer playing my retro systems on my little 14 inch CRT in my office, you know, because that's kind of how I remember them. But I know that's not a solution that everyone can use or, you know, has access to. And, you know, if I want to sometimes play one of my old school machines in the living room, at the moment I can't because my TV, you know, I've got a. Um, a Sony 65 inch TV that Is came out about two years yeah. ago. Yeah, yeah, four, yeah, 4K. It's, it's, it's only got HDMI. I'll that. bring my Mega Drive around with the RF. <laughs> when I plug this in, Dan. Yeah. That's the thing, because it's, it's only got HDMI inputs on yeah. it. I think it, randomly, I think it does have a composite input still. Um, it hasn't got SCART on there. But then I did try getting a, uh, a cheapy um, composite to HDMI adapter off eBay for, for about five quid or something to plug in um, 
I think it might have been the Mega Drive, actually. I took that in there one day and yeah, the game was probably around on screen about five seconds after I'd done something on the controller. Oh, it was really? like so, uh, yeah, playing. It wasn't very playable. And MVG <laughs> was playing like Gran Turismo uh, on the PlayStation yeah. 2. Gran Turismo 2, I think. And it just yeah. looked mind blowing, like, you know, just absolutely beautiful, upscaled. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not for everyone, you know, there are us purists, you know, like me that prefer, you know, the CRT kind of look. But I think if you are going to play your, your classic machines on a modern display, this is going to make them look the best they possibly can. Like I said, so many different inputs as well composite, component, S video, RGB, SCAR as well. So, it's, uh, yeah, pretty much any retro system is going to plug into this and look nice on your modern telly. So, uh, nice little solution, I think, that. Now, something else that we spotted this week, um, maybe you're planning on making your own Sonic game. And it turns out that apparently Sega are giving you the green light to do this. Now, we've covered, obviously, lots of kind of Sega fan projects over the years. And we've always said that Sega are generally pretty lenient mm. in letting their fans get away with this. But now it looks like there is actually a semi-official statement. This is by uh, Katie Mini Kitty. <laughs> it doesn't sound much of a business lady by her, uh, her Twitter handle, I must admit. But she is actually, um, she works for Sega. She's uh, Sega of America's associate social media and influencer manager. And she said it's all right. Yeah, so she's put, hey, Sonic fans, I appreciate you're all reaching out with concerns over fan games and money, money ta- moneyization. Is that how you say it? Monetization. 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 There we go. So as long as it's as long as no profit is involved, there is usually no issue with y'all using our blue boy uh, to hone your own art and dev skills. I butchered that then. Um, but then she's put for legal reasons. I can't promise all content is okay. So like you say, it's sort of like a green light and sort of isn't, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah, it's know. it's like you know we're we're not gonna go mad like Nintendo do over every single asset. Like if if you're not repackaging this stuff and selling it, yeah. then uh, and we're not gonna go actively on the hunt to kind of take projects down unless they're making money, which is which is fair dues. I think it's uh, yeah, it's still very. It's not an official one, you know. She's saying y'all, <laughs> like, um, yeah. So hey, y'all, <laughs> it's, yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty casual, you know. But um, it's it's nice to know that they're aware of it and yeah, uh, that they're on the fan side because, like you said, Sonic Mania, you know, that was that came from a fan project with a uh, Christian Whitehead, yeah. you know, and uh, that's one of the biggest successes uh, they've yeah. had recently. So. Yeah, absolutely. What what I do like is you know she then kind of goes on again in the thread. Uh, you know, we can handle the outliers case by case when we notice them, but our goal isn't to strive everything. Uh, but then she points out, can we, you know, not use my, you know, use this feed as a uh, a way to kind of like snitch on people? <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't, use this, don't use this in court. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of thing. So please do not use this thread to call out any specific groups or people. We are all learning here and appreciate how. So that does make me laugh that obviously some people have probably then messaged off the back of it and gone, oh, have you seen this one now? <laughs> And now we've talked about it on here. There's 1.2 thousand people have um, hearted the tweet on Twitter. So it is out there now. And again, I mean, yeah, it does kind of prove, you know, the difference between, you know, the two companies that are always compared, Nintendo and Sega, even though these days, I mean, they're very different. But, um, you know, the fact that Nintendo are instantly cease and desist on pretty much all fan projects. But then, I mean, recently we've covered quite a few, you know, Nintendo kind of fan remakes. And I don't don't want to jinx things or anything. But it feels like, you know, there might be coming around to them can a bit you, more. You know, we've talked still, about a few recently that are still on, aren't can they? Can you still upload YouTube videos with Nintendo footage? Or they, do they get taken down straight away? I haven't chanced it, but go I think on, give it a go. 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 <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, none of us have checked car. in a while. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, this has been these fan projects we've talked about a few of them over was, the last couple of months. I was going to say, a few we've right. spoke about, and at the time of us speaking about them or releasing the episodes, they're still there, you know, which is unlike, unlike Nintendo, so... They're just yeah. writing a list from the retro hour and they're going to go and attack them all. Joe will get called up in court as a witness. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> I only We've downloaded it play- once. You've been playing Super Mario 64 in your browser, Joe. <laughs> <Have I? laughs> You're going down, son. I am. <laughs> uh, but there is, I mean, if you look at the comments as well on this Nintendo Life article, they do point out there's a guy in here called uh, Enter Username who says, you know, he's actually pointing out here that Sega are not always as lenient as they're making out here. You remember they did take down the uh, Streets of Rage fan remake about... 
2011. Obviously, that was a decade ago now, but that was one project they did, you know, take, do a season to assist on that. You know, after years of development on that project, they took it down. Yeah, but I think, you know, because Streets of Rage 4 was kind of in planning and development mm. for so long, I think that might be, you know, they were like, well, we are I, bringing out Maybe Streets assets that they think are worth it, you know. Yeah, because <laughs> no. it was, you know, because Streets of Rage 4 was kind of like, you know, on paper for what 20 years if that do you know what i mean they were kind of like on about releasing one so that's the only thing i can think of because of the the ip was actually like yeah we are going to release this at some point and it's not as big as sonic you know with sonic mm. you know it's such a big household kind of name like they don't mind anybody kind of using him you know to have a play around and stuff like that whereas the streets of rage maybe they don't want people to think like oh this is an official release do you know what i mean or associate it and she only talks about Sonic in the tweet, doesn't she? Yeah. She doesn't mention any other Sega franchises. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah. And it kind of feels like, you know, that the fans are really the ones that have made Sonic more relevant, especially, you know, like you said, with Sonic Mania. Mm-hmm. You know, more, more than Sega have done with any titles in the last 10 years, at least. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, uh, yeah, we're still hoping for that new um, new great Sonic game off the back of the movies, though. That's got to happen, so fingers <laughs> crossed. Now, this will excite you, Joe. We talked about this uh, game quite a bit on this show, but now... For your Nintendo Switch, Zombies Ate My Neighbours, and actually another game. Are you a fan of Ghoul Patrol back in the day? I'm not big on Ghoul Patrol. So, uh, Patrol. Right. Ghoul Patrol, there we go. I'm not big on Ghoul Patrol, to be perfectly honest. So Ghoul Patrol is like the unofficial sequel to Zombies Ate My Neighbours. Yeah. Which is interesting that, you know, they're both on there. They're both Lucasfilm, you know, uh, LucasArts games, you know, from the SNES generation or 16-bit generation. But Ghoul Patrol only came out on the SNES, and then Zombie Ate My Neighbours came out on the Mega Drive and the SNES. So it's it's cool that they actually are putting them together as kind of like the Zombie Ate My Neighbors pack. But yeah, this is coming out for the Switch on the 29th of June, which I am really excited about because Zombies Ate My Neighbors is probably my in my top five Mega Drive games, probably in my top 10, maybe top 20 games of all time. It is one of my favorite couch co-op games. And they're not just porting it. It's just not like a straight, straight up port. Like, you know, they've, they've kind of remastered it and they've put lots of like, you know, they've put achievements in there and they've... um put like a museum so you can look at the artwork and unlock artwork and stuff like that and you know there's going to be safe states in it because it's a very very tough game even with passwords because of when you use the passwords to kind of get back to the level you're on you lose all your equipment and weapons you've picked up um so i yeah. think that's definitely needed because really as a veteran player of zombies Ain't my neighbors there's 55 levels and i can usually only get to about level 20 before you know before i'm done like dead kind of thing um and then you use your password and you start with nothing uh, but yeah, I'm really, really excited about this. And I, I pray to the retro game gods that we get a physical release of this, even if it's through like, you know, one of the third party kind of like producers and stuff like that. But I've got a feeling it might just come out, you know, straight to digital. But yeah, it's coming out through um, .mu. You know, the guys who, funny enough, who did Streets of Rage 4 and are doing oh, wow. the new... Those guys are on fire on at the fire moment. At the moment. They're doing the new Turtles game. Um, yep. You know, interestingly, this has been announced today at the point of recording on the 11th of, of uh, May, and it's coming out on the 29th of June, but we don't have a release date for the new Turtles game still, which was announced like a month ago. <laughs> um, may, maybe this game, you know, this IP isn't as big as Turtles, and that's probably why. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited for this, and it's got couch co-op, so I definitely want to sit down and play it with you guys at some point. Yeah, they seem like they're doing a really good job of kind of getting these old titles back and and, and all of the really good titles as well. You know, like they're really picking them well. Yeah, and also I think the fact that, you know, that these games, like you said then, Joe, they when, when you get like a game that you used to love back in the day, but there is certain things about it that kind of bugged you or, you know, maybe ways of playing it back then that don't really work so well anymore. I do like it when they kind of fix those things up yeah. and make them more relevant for today's audiences. Yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, there's the whole saying, like, is it NES hard or, you know, is it just hard game kind of thing? Like, I always hear yeah. NES hard is like that classic. It's hard because you can't save it and stuff like that. Or it's, you know, the controls are perfect and stuff. If if you mess up in the game, it's because you messed up. It's because your your skills aren't good enough. That is kind of like a perfect example, Zombies in My Neighbours, of that kind of, you know, that era. But it is so difficult, you know, to do 55 levels in one sitting as well. You, you know, you've got to be in. I'm, I'm, I like to think myself as an expert at this game because whenever I play it with anybody, I'm like, let's play this game. I love this game. They, they die on like the second level. They're out. Do you know what I mean? So I'm very glad that they've updated that, you know, with the saving and stuff in it. And I don't feel the same. I find you know, as I get older, my gameplay skills, whether it's because I don't play games as much as I did when I was a kid and a teenager, you know, when I had like, you know, I, I could get home from school and play games from like, you know, tea time till bedtime. 
whether it's just because I don't play them as much anymore, but my gameplay skills when I revisit these old games, <laughs> I'm mostly terrible at yeah, them. You now. haven't yeah, got the focus, Dan. No. <laughs> yeah, we haven't you. got the attention spans. Like you say, you 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 know, you would or all, all the free time you'd you get home from school and play it all night and now now I'm lucky if I get an hour a night. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So yeah, um looking forward to seeing how how good we all are at this when it comes out on the twenty ninth. Yeah, fingers crossed it's got um, some kind of save or rewind function. They are quite uh, handy when I play these old games. <laughs> cheats. <laughs> yeah, are the cheats still True. in there? Can we look them up? <laughs> now, last week on the show, we set something up that actually we've had a really nice response to. And it's actually quite heartwarming to see as well, because we asked you to tell us about your favourite local retro video game shop. Now, the reason we did this is because I know you guys have been out retro gaming shopping again, and you just realised how nice it is to actually walk into a shop that's dedicated to a hobby and being able to look at the games on the shelf and meet like-minded people and a space where you can go and check out these systems and often get some really good deals on them as well. So not that we're saying we can do this single-handedly, but anything that we can do to help keep retro gaming shops alive after what's been, you know, a terrible year for all of the retail sector, um, we thought it would be nice if we can do our bit because, you know, there is nothing quite like going into a retro gaming shop and just picking up games, is it? No, there? and like, you know, the new generation of kids and stuff, they need to experience this. They need to know the fun of going into a retro store, finding a bargain, and, uh, you know, just being able to see some of the older items, but being able to go into a physical place and, and have the excitement of buying games. You know, video ga- uh, VHS shops have gone. Like, we've got record shops, luckily. And uh, mm. it's good to have these retro gaming stores still. So we started a kind of campaign and uh, you guys can contact us on the website or tweet us and send us your kind of retro stores and the ones that you've been experiences, experiencing. And we had a uh, David Weller contact us and he's told us about this store called Item Drop, which is in Seaton, Devon. And it's uh, run by a husband and wife team. And he said, they sell lots of retro games consoles as well as modern games and lots of gaming merch. They don't open on weekends though, and you know I've I've got some photos of this, so we can we can have a little look at this place. It looks really cool, actually. Uh, I don't know if there's many stores in Devon or, or, or around that area. What stores in general yeah. or retro stores? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's just uh, ice cream stores. Yeah, just ice cream shops. Yeah, man, this looks really cool. Um, I, I love a good retro game shop, you know, it's, you know, all packed in there nicely and a very large, you know, variation, like, you know, from all the way down, you know, from your kind of 8-bit consoles and stuff all the way up to modern gaming, which I really like. There's, there's no off-limit kind of games, do you know what I mean? They buy a Mega Drive and sell Mega Drive and stuff like that as well, which I love. Yeah, uh, they say that they're gaming geek, pop culture and retro, so they've got like, mm. loads of games there, PS1, PS2, Mega Drive and like tons of video game memorabilia, so... If you're down there, go go check them out and support them. Yeah, so uh, do check them out. And of course, if you've got a favourite retro gaming shop near you, it can be anywhere in the world that you think we should feature as our Retro Gaming Shop of the Week. You can get in touch on Twitter. We are at Retro Hour UK or get in touch via our Facebook page or you can just email us show at the retro hour dot com. Now, before we get into our guest this week, we'll be talking to Dave Warhol all about Intellivision, making music on the Commodore 64, the Mega Drive, the NES, the Game Boy, loads to cram into this week's interview. Can we just take a moment to give a big thank you to this episode's sponsor, our wonderful friends at Curve. Now, Curve is quite a simple mission. They want to simplify your life by making your daily finances more efficient. And we've all had this problem, you know, where... The other day I was in Subway, you know, you've got your card. I'm like, oh, I've got, I had an app, but it was on my old phone. I didn't download it on my new one. Or you go into Boots and you've left your Advantage card or, or your wife's got one and you haven't got one. Or it could even be Joe, you know, trying to buy stuff on eBay and not tell the missus and then, you know, realise that you've used the wrong card. So all these cards that we have to carry around with us in our wallets. Now you can have your MasterCard, your Visas, all on one card and one app with Curve. I can just imagine Dan, like, ordering a huge sandwich. <laughs> just going, I haven't got any money in the sandwich guy staring at him. <laughs> but with Curve, you'd be all right because uh, it's absolutely fantastic. Like it, it simplifies your life and uh, yeah, finances as well. So you can actually see how much you're spending and it's got no monthly fees. So you can basically get it for free. Sign up and it will boost your cards. And 
oh, it's just amazing. I've been using it a lot. I'm a huge fan of Curve. And, uh, you know, you can get cash back on your retailers as well. So you can select your retailers that you use all of the time. And there's loads of supermarkets on there, actually. My, my supermarket's on there. So every time I go to the supermarket, do my shopping, I'm getting some cash back mm. on Amazon. I'm getting some cash back, um, which is really cool, actually. You know, you, you, you just wouldn't be getting that with other stuff. Also, uh, it's got purchase protection as well for up to 100,000 euros. So if you are buying stuff and uh, you get that extra protection, which is amazing. And uh, yeah, especially for us, you know, guys that are buying often secondhand stuff or, you know, on online, you know, it's often they haven't got warranties and stuff. So having that protection on there, really valuable for us. Yeah. And it, and it kind of gives you an idea as well. Like I've been using it recently and it categorizes everything into categories. And uh, the one category that I'm ignoring is food. <laughs> I've been mean, spending a lot on that. You spent a hundred thousand euros on McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> Just ignore the this food section. Yeah. But it does mean you know your debit, your credit, your loyalty cards all in one place. Really simplifies your life. Boosts the power of all of your cards by giving you one percent cash back at your favourite retailers as well. Great exchange rates across all of your cards, and they've got the incredible go back in time feature, which uh, is the one that saved Joe's bottom a few times. This is where you can actually switch payments from one card to another up to 90 days after the fact. So if you use the wrong card for something, you can swap it over to another one, really simple. And it just makes it, I think it's exciting, you know, it just feel like this is the way that we're all going to be using cards in the next few years. So it means you can jump on there, be part of it right now, and uh, just take in, you know, the stress out of it and simplifying your life as well. So we want you to try Curve for yourself. And like Ravi said, the Curve Blue card has got no monthly fees. It will still boost all your other cards as well. And you will get some free money. Come on, can we make this any better? You will get £5 after your first transaction. If you sign up using our exclusive code, head to curve.com slash retro to get involved with Curve right now. And of course, you'll be helping out the Retro Hour podcast by supporting our sponsors. That's curve.com slash retro. And a big thank you to Curve for supporting the Retro Hour podcast. Now, we had a great patrons hangout on Sunday night this week, didn't we? Oh, yeah. That yeah, was man. We, we ended up talking about horror films and like yeah. kind of yeah. 80s films and the films that scared us when we were children, um, which was really fun, to be honest. That was really interesting. And, you know, talking about, you know, pretty much what films you hadn't seen and have seen and, you know, going away with some gems and stuff. But I think it was just it was just cool to hang out, isn't it? You know, especially with yeah. like how things have been the last year and stuff like that. It's, it's cool just to sit back with friends and have a beer. It was good uh, to have a regular chat and man, Nosferatu, that still scares me today. <laughs> Yeah, because we were talking about yeah films that scared us, and you know, I remembered uh, my cousin when I was uh, like eight, nine years old, making me watch Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah, <laughs> then you know, yeah. having to go Far to bed and try to get some sleep after yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I mean, that's the kind of thing we do. We hang out once a month. It's a bit like, it's like a virtual users group, isn't Mm. it? Yeah, so we all get together. We've got a great regular group of people. And, you know, some new faces that joined us for the most recent one as well, which was fantastic. And we all just get together for a couple of hours once a month and just nerd out and help each other out as well. Sometimes, you know, we we get suggestions on bits of hardware. I was, you know, talking to the guys about my new Commodore 128 that I mentioned before that's got a bit of a display problem. I got some advice on them that I'm going to, you know, follow up and hopefully get it looking perfect now so it is great to have that community there and uh, of course if you do back us on patreon you can join us for the next one and you will also get 11 episodes that you can unlock of our second podcast the retro hour after hours now this is where anything kind of goes on the after hours podcast yeah it's unedited we we, we talk about the past nostalgia and uh mad tales of the past <laughs> yeah it's, it's just absolutely fantastic uh but yeah now most recent one we take a trip back to the year 2000 so if you want to relive you know the playstation 2 coming out and um, talking about you know peer-to-peer sharing the websites nokia mobile phones all kinds of stuff that we talk about about an hour and a half long actually so you can unlock those you get the regular podcast early you get it ad free and also you get a mention in the most prestigious high score table in the world of retro gaming of course the retro hour hall of fame and this one week a massive shout to our latest patrons hi to boar's head tavern bbs duncan beresford darren coles simon pilgrim and richard benjamin k who all made donations into the running of the show we really appreciate your continued support thank you so much and if you'd like to join them you'll find the link on our website at theretrohour.com right next we're going to be talking to a true veteran 
of the video games industry, going all the way back to his days at Mattel, working on the Intellivision, right through the 80s and 90s. Our special guest next is Dave Warhol, and he's coming up on the Retro Hour podcast. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast and it is time for our favourite bit of the show where we welcome on a very special guest. Now today we're going to be talking to Dave Warhol who's actually worked on so many systems. I've got to be honest Dave, I've kind of got a bit of cramp in my scrolling finger from going through your Moby Games profile. You've worked on that many systems and games over the years. Yeah, I think I've released on everything but the Jaguar, I think. (laughs) But it is an honour to be talking to you. Thank you so much for joining us this week. Oh, it's a real pleasure and uh, you guys are doing great work so i'm honored to be a part of it fantastic now before we get into your story and you know the incredible companies and games that you've worked on we always like to find out your uh, geek credentials and kind of go back to day one i mean do you remember what initially got you interested in computers and video games where did your journey begin oh gosh uh, it would have started with that old uh, uh, video game computer space if you remember the upright console which was uh, all vector at the time I, as i understand it was done in hardware um, and and I, I looked at that and I said, uh, gosh, I, I was probably in the seventh grade. It's like a pinball machine, but it's a TV set. Um, so uh, I would uh, you know, seek out that in arcades or any uh, you know, Pong or anything like that. And then, uh, honestly, I got into computer games in high school. Our uh, school district was able to, we were able to log into our school district's mainframe computer. And I had, you know, the... Uh, the teletype, 110 baud kind of thing, to, 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 to just chunking out things. So I started programming games, um, uh, in, I guess, in a junior or senior in high school, which would have been 76 or 77. But it was all on uh, printed out paper. Uh, the best we were able to uh, play it that way. Uh, of course, keeping an eye on the consoles, the uh, 2600 and the Intellivision, when they started to get into uh, distribution. Um, big fan of that. And I was playing in the arcade, so I'm, I'm definitely a, a classic arcade fan, too. I actually ditched college courses to go to an arcade, and little did I realize that was as valuable as the courses I was taking <laughs> in college to, to, uh, to actually, uh, to my career. Well, have you got a background in music as well? Were you, were you reading some music as a child? Oh, um, uh, absolutely. I took piano lessons a little bit, like in the second grade, and played the trombone, and then uh, gradually most lower brass instruments. And my uh, my degree in college is in music composition, so uh, I've always been musically inclined and interested. And so it was a natural kind of crossover as as I started developing games to be developing uh, music for the games as well. Well, we had um, a good friend of yours, Don Daglow, on the show last year, and I know your first job in the industry was at Mattel Electronics, and I believe that Don actually gave you the job there. Is that correct? Yeah, it was a cute story. I was working for the. We met. Well, we did, we went to the same college. Uh, Pomona College in Claremont, California. And um, uh, I was working for the college the year after I graduated, and Don had graduated a few years before. So we'd never met there, but he reached out to the campus to uh, to say, uh, hey, we, we're hiring at Mattel Electronics. Would you please post this job for your graduating seniors? And I was working at the computer center, and I said, post it for the graduating seniors? Are you kidding me? I'm going to apply for this myself. So I ended up you know, applying um, uh, that way, that's how that's how I heard about the job, and then um, interviewed with Don and a few other people. Um, and then I did eventually post the job too. And another uh, Pomona College alumnus, uh, Eddie Dombrower, uh, who worked at Mattel Electronics, also uh, uh, heard about it through Don. Did you have any ambitions to work in the industry before you saw that? Then, oh gosh, no. I, I mean, I would have loved to, um, but I didn't know the first thing about it. Um, I was interviewing for other types of like systems programmers or systems maintenance and things like that for these big mainframe computers. Um, the, the PCs were, well, I guess, yeah, the PC had just barely come out and the Apple II had come out. Um, but uh, no, not, not until I, I uh, heard about this job at Mattel did I realize that it would be a, a real possibility. And had you been programming games on your own before you went to Mattel? Yeah, um, absolutely, but it was uh, not on microprocessors. Uh, was mostly on mainframes and and larger larger computers, uh, which is which is what I learned on. I remember when I got the job at Mattel, uh, you know, I, I passed all their qualifications and all that, and I was thinking to myself, "Gosh, I have no idea how this is done. How do you even write a letter or make a number on the screen? How is that even done?" And I just kind of told myself, "Well, 
if people can do it, I can figure it out too. So it, it was really an open-mindedness of uh, getting exposed to the architecture. So I hadn't done any microprocessor programming for games until I got the job at Mattel. You know, that process of learning the hardware, I find quite interesting as well. When you were hired, was it kind of like a like a, an internal course they gave you or were you just kind of dropped in the deep end, like, you know, the manual, learn this? That was pretty much it. The, 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 uh, it was, here's the manual, here's a development system that you had to share with four or five other people. And uh, they had a little test program uh, that they called Killer Tomatoes, which was the cheesiest movie of all time. And it was, it was simply a, a running man running around on the screen. And when, uh, when it touched an object, the, the man changed color. The idea was, well, take this little framework of a program and just start messing around with it to get yourself familiar with the program. And, um, you know, I spent a couple of weeks and then I, I had an idea for a game that I wanted to do. So as I was training myself how to use the system, I started programming up this game and uh, little by little it came together. And so uh, about four or five weeks into my uh, training at Mattel, I wrote up a memo that said, hey, I'd like to propose doing this game as one of the games. And it got approved. And that was Mind Strike, which is my first game. It's kind of a, a real time, a kind of a Stratego game, but played in real time. Uh, so, so, yeah, my training project turned out to be my actual first game. Yeah, because I've seen Mind Strike. I haven't actually played the game before, but I've seen videos of it, and it kind of looked like a like a futuristic chess game almost. Yeah, it's uh, the the high concept is uh, what if you were playing chess against somebody, but you didn't have to take turns. What if your pawns moved really quickly and your queen and your rooks moved slowly? Uh, so I might be able to uh, you know make a lot of small moves while you're making uh, uh, one big important move. Uh, and then the uh, kicker on that is what happens if you break your queen up into four pawns and then you could move them across the board and reassemble them back into a queen. So the, the, the balance of the game is that while you're moving very powerful pieces that are more or less uh, difficult to defeat, if you want to get anywhere, you got to break them up into vulnerable pieces and then reconnect them on the, uh, on the other side of the board. So influenced by Stratego for sure and also checkers and chess. I guess it's got the simplicity of checkers uh, where the pieces all move the same way. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, there's, there's a, a lot to it. It's best played in real time where you're playing against people. You could play a turn-based version of it where you just took turns and the speed didn't matter. But the real fun part was when you were, um, when you were playing in real time against uh, an opponent. Well, you were part of the legendary Blue Sky Rangers. And, you know, hearing that name as a kid, it always sounded like, you know, a rock group or something. What was kind of the, the story with the name and what was the group for people that might not be familiar with it? Well, gosh, uh, the Blue Sky Rangers was a, a name given to the group. Uh, there was an article written about the, the team, the game developers, in TV Guide, the magazine. Um, and it was the author of that article who nicknamed the group the Blue Sky Rangers. We didn't really use it that much while we were there at Mattel, but after uh, Mattel shut down, that's how we uh, kind of kept in touch and all that. But uh, it probably referenced 40, maybe 40 or 50 people in the applications development department um, that were all uh, uh, game developers. And it, it just had to do with their out there in the blue sky doing things that nobody else had done before or, or that were just really dreamy or um, uh, so, uh, yeah, it, it was more of a name given to us after we kind of all graduated from there, uh, more than how what the name of the department was. So they, they give us really boring titles, uh, application software uh, kind of stuff. Yeah, Blue Sky Ranger sounds a lot cooler than um, application <laughs> software program. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, obviously, having a music background, initially, were you focusing on programming at first? And how did you get into the music side of it and the audio side? Well, the, I was hired as a game programmer. Uh, a game designer and game programmer. So I was coding games, but because of my background and interest in music, the Intellivision specifically had a pretty good sound chip, but really bad support for it. It took a lot of uh, ROM space or, or a, a program space just to play something like do da dee da dee It was very inefficient. You know, we were counting every byte that we uh, used uh, back in those days when a game was 4K, uh, 4K or 8K. Um, you just couldn't put in a bunch of music. Yeah, I, I think even on my uh, on my first project, uh, I developed a way to code music so that it would only take one byte per note instead of five bytes per note. 
and that allowed me to start putting in a lot of uh, a lot more music and sounds in, in games. And then for people would tap me to do the sounds for other games. So while I only did while I was at Matella, uh, a handful of games uh, did music on uh, music or sounds more than music on uh, maybe a, a dozen or so. Yes, I mean, how big were the in television carts? Were they like what four K? Four K, yeah. The original yeah. ones were were four K, uh, and then maybe if you were lucky, you got eight K. And I think Mind Strike might have been eight K or twelve K because it had a computer player built into it. Yeah, they were they were all very limited. But the Intellivision had a bunch of routines built into it. It had an operating system, believe it or not. So. Um, a lot of the stuff that was reusable between games was built into the console. So as long as you used those routines, uh, you were able to uh, maximize the the 8K that you had because you know, maybe there was another 4K, 2K or 4K in the operating system. And I was thinking of working on those really limited platforms by today's standards, probably really taught, you know, really strict programming efficiency and really making the most of every byte. I mean, you know, a mouse cursor is probably a hundred times the size of an Intellivision cart today. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, there's a, a ratio that I kind of coined, which had to do with what's the ROM size compared to how many hours of gameplay are you supposed to get out of a, a game? If you yeah. think about it, uh, if you're supposed to get 20 hours of gameplay out of a 8K cartridge, that, that means each minute is like four and a half bytes. I forget what the math is. Uh, but then as you start getting into your, uh, Commodore 64, or you start getting into uh, N64, uh, larger games, you might have 128K instead of just 4K. You're still expected to get about 20 hours out of it. So if you think about the ratio, that means that there's more ROM space per minute of gameplay. And then when you start getting onto CDs and DVDs, you've got four gigabytes. Okay, I played it for 20 hours, but that's about 2.3 meg every minute instead of you know, maybe four and a half bytes. So if you kind of go back, it meant that those bytes were really important for how <laughs> much time you spent playing the game. Yeah, that's an interesting formula. Um, and I know you worked on a game called Thin Ice as well, and I was reading the background on that game. And I know um, Mattel had like a deal with Data East where they could use some of their arcade titles. And I read that Thin Ice was originally a, uh, a game that wouldn't be considered very politically correct today called Disco Number no. One. I mean, do you kind of know the background on that and what happened there? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, we did have a Data East license. We did Lock and Chase, which was Data East, and then uh, also had Disco Number no. One. We had the Disco Number no. One machine on the floor. But I don't think Mattel, being family friendly, wanted to use. They wanted to use the game mechanic, but they did not want to use, uh, you know, that that topic. And uh, I think it was Keith Robinson, the, the you know, really in, in, in television charismatic founder. He's he's the guy who really kept the Blue Sky Rangers. Uh, he passed a few years back. I think it was his idea to make it be the um, the penguin that was skating around the seals instead of the dancer uh, going around the dance floor. And then um, Julie Hoshizaki uh, was tapped to program it. And I did the music and sounds, but then famously that's the first soundtrack that uh, I asked my friend George Sanger to write a ditty for. Uh, and that was his uh, his first foray into video game music. And I know you and um, Connie Goldman developed one of the most famous in television games, the medieval fantasy game Thunder Castle. And I know that had quite a long development cycle. What was kind of the the story there and what was working on that game like? Well, it was very gracious of you to say that that's one of the most prestigious or whatever your term was, thanks. So but, uh, you know, I don't look at it that way. I always like Deadly Discs. That's my go-to when I think of these right. <laughs> Um Well, Connie, uh, a, a profound artist, uh, and she was programming the game. She was doing all the graphics and all the programming, but because she was doing both, um, it was slowing her down in the release cycle. Uh, so after I finished, um, uh, gosh, I, I forget what was uh, Mind Strike. Uh, I was assigned to do the the programming and game design while she was doing the graphics, and that really, you know, freed her up just to do what she did best. And uh, and then I got to sink my teeth into doing that, the the, the coding. Um, now Mattel uh, Mattel Electronics went out of business before the game was released. Um, I think we'd finished it, so it it, it might have been a long cycle. Uh, because it was a number of years before it was released. Uh, Connie might have been working on it for, uh, I don't know, three to six months before I joined the team, and that would have only been another 
three or four months until the game was done. Um, uh, but but yeah, it, it like thin ice. There were a handful of titles that were not released by Mattel Electronics, but had been completed. And then when INTV Corporation started supporting the platform again, that's when we dusted those off and released them. And how long did you stay with the company? Were you there when the, the video game crash happened? Oh, yeah. I was part of the crew that was let go on that that uh, in early January. Um, uh, gosh, was it 83? I forget which, early 80s. Yeah, I was fortunate enough to have survived the uh, the layoffs that they had leading up to that. And the company, because they wanted to sell all of their Christmas inventory, they uh, Mattel had a lot of uh, a lot riding on this. And if they had told the the world that oh well we're going to shut our electronics division down, uh, then I don't know that people they would have sold through as much inventory as they wanted. So they really gave uh, the programmers a very generous severance package that said no 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 we're not going to shut down. Believe us, we'll give you three month severance if we did shut down. So don't worry, we're not shutting down. And so all the programmers had a lot of confidence of uh, they're not going to shut down. Uh, and then sure enough, come January, after they blew through their Christmas sales, um, the, the, you know, they ended up, gosh, they lost what, 200 million. It almost took the whole Mattel toy company down. Uh, in my interactions with people from Mattel toys, when I say worked at Mattel Electronics, they kind of wag a finger at me. And say, oh, you guys. You obviously got to use your music skills when you worked on the the Commodore 64. I mean, that machine, we've had so many Commodore 64 musicians on this show. And Rob Hubbard, we've had him on several times. I know he's, he's someone you look up to as well. Did you think the C64 was a revolution in computer music at that time? Oh, absolutely. The, uh, the Intellivision had three square waves, and that was it. And then the uh, C64 had uh, you know, the ability to change the wave shape as well. And then it had uh, ADSR, it had envelopes, volume envelopes that you could program. Um, and then it even had a, a sweep filter where you could uh, uh, distort the sound even further. So there was so much more to play with uh, on the C64. Uh, yeah, really, really exciting platform. Although the first run of the C64 the filter didn't work, and I didn't realize it because I I had uh, I'd bought in like the second or the third run, and I programmed it really heavily into one of the soundtracks I was working on. I think it was Racing Destruction Set, and the programmer who listened to it was like, "This doesn't sound good at all." And it turned wow. out that it was because it was the filter that didn't work. And I I don't remember if we released like that or or and just and said, "Well, that's the filter," or if I took it out. But yeah, there was. So much, and, and then the space it got all sorts of space to play with. Gosh, I, I was usually given 4K just to do my music rather than just, you know, 800 bytes or something like that. And how were you making music on the C64? Did you have tools or were you doing all, you know, pokes and peaks? How, how did you work it? Uh, this, is, this was in the days before MIDI. Uh, so what I would do is I would write music out longhand and then I would type it in as assembly defined byte statements. And I would have some macros that I could use like note. Uh, C sharp four, comma uh, eighth, and then note, uh, you know, whatever, whatever it was. So I, w I was typing in longhand macros of data statements, uh, and then my drivers would interpret those data statements. Um, sometimes I would modify the driver around the the piece just to be memory efficient. Um, if I knew the piece was only going to be in a four octave range or something like that, I might change the driver so that it would take less space to, to keep the music uh, going, things like that. But um, yeah, it was just using an assembler uh, and, and uh, typing it in longhand. Well, you founded your own company, um, Real Time Associates, in 1986. Where did that idea come from and what was kind of the background on, on that? Well, that was uh, in large part because of the the, the, the guys who bought the rights to the Intellivision product line uh, needed some technical support. And uh, I would hooked up with them at a trade show once, and they'd offered me the gig to develop games for, for them. So I would say real-time associates, it might have even been before we were named that, got its start in doing another 20-plus Intellivision games uh, in the mid-'80s. Uh, and then uh, looking at the Intellivision and how inferior it was to the uh, then to the NES, uh, we reverse engineered the NES and started shopping our skill set around on that platform. Uh, and then I think Real Time Associates. Uh, well, we started then hiring full time 
employees, uh, late eighties, early nineties, um, as a, as a kind of a full service studio at that time. But I know you worked with, um, Lucas Arts or, you know, Lucasfilm games as it was back then on several titles. How did that relationship come about? Uh, one of our, uh, Blue Sky Rangers, uh, Mike Breen was his name, um, uh, moved up to the Bay Area after Mattel Electronics shut down, and he got a contracting gig with uh, Lucas, I guess it was called Lucasfilm Games at the time. And um, uh, he very generously said, well, you know, if you need some sounds done, I, I know this guy down in L.A., he certainly can pull that off. Um, and by then, I'd probably done a dozen or so um, uh, projects for electronic arts. And um, so, so... Mike made the introduction. I, I went up, met the crew, and and yeah, it was great, great working conditions uh, and wonderful projects to contribute to their product line. And I got to meet so many founders of the game industry there: uh, Ron Gilbert, uh, uh, gosh, uh, uh, Noah Falstein, David Fox, uh, Eric Wilmander, um, quite the crew. Uh, and and I kind of learned a lot. It was funny because I would fly up from L.A. to visit them. And every time I would go up there, we'd, people would come out of their offices and we'd just be talking for like two or three hours about the state of the gaming industry and what would be a neat project. And, and as I was talking to my contact there, AJ Redmer, I was like, when do you guys get any work done? Every time I'm up here, everybody's out in the hallway talking about stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and he, he gave me a, a kind of a saying that, uh, that has always stuck with me um, to this day, which is, well, you know, we expect people to put in a good eight hours of work on their projects. But if they do that over the course of nine or 10 or 11 hours, who are we to complain? And besides that, that uh, kind of intellectual discussion and cross pollination of ideas and things like that is pretty healthy for the crew. So, uh, so yeah, I, I knew if I came up, maybe I remember bringing up a uh, NEC computer game system they hadn't seen. So everybody's out looking at it, playing it. Um, that was more the exception rather than the rule, I'm sure. Have you got any memories that stand out of um, Skywalker Ranch back then? I did pass George Lucas on a staircase once, and I'm sure he wondered, who the heck is that guy? <laughs> I don't remember hiring him. No, really, other than the, the fact that there were uh, all these people just really iterating on great uh, game design concepts. To be able to start, uh, what I was amazed was being able to start with such a high concept of what they're after. What would have, you know, what their storytelling games were attempting or, you know, Let's let's drive emotion rather than gameplay. Uh, for me, being an action kind of a video game guy, I'm always about you know when do you press the button and how far do you jump and when do you shoot. Uh, these guys were working with such uh, more uh, I, I want to say profound or or uh, kind of great vision concept. So uh, the, my relationship with them is always one of uh, respect and um, and yeah, I took a lot away from that in terms of what. When you're designing a game, is it really about the mechanics or is it about the mood or is it about the message? Uh, yeah, other than uh, the ranch is a great place to, uh, to be, um, it was uh, very inspiring, but for other reasons. I mean, were you personally a fan of adventure games like you know, the Infocom and Sierra games? Did you play those before then? Oh, absolutely. The text adventure games I, I um, grew up on, I would buy them. Uh, you know, I would rifle through them every time I was in a game shop to see if there's one I hadn't seen yet or hadn't heard of yet. And um, yeah, really big fan of the of the Infocom line. Uh, and then, of course, the graphic adventures are just uh, you know, fun. I, I got to know uh, through Brian Moriarty, uh, who used to work at Infocom and went to Lucasfilm. From there, he was able to introduce me to uh, some of the, the Infocom team. And actually, I'm speaking with Steve Moretzky today at 530 just to catch up. But uh, Great. yeah, those those are very inspiring. And and I don't know if um, if uh, this has come up in any of your reading, but there was a game uh, Real Time Associates did for the iPhone called Soul Trapper, and it's yeah. an audio text adventure. It's like, what would a text adventure be like if you couldn't read it, but all you could do is put on your earphones and then press buttons from there. And so it, it had a very strong lineage to the. Uh, to the text adventure days. And, and I, I did end up acknowledging uh, Bob Bates and Brian Moriarty and Steve Moretzky for their review of that game while it was in production and the, and the ideas that they were able to provide that helped keep it true to that kind of text adventure days. So I almost feel, you know, text adventures, they're a very pure style of video game. It kind of reminds me of, you know, reading a book and painting a picture in your mind as opposed to watching the movie. 
Oh yeah, absolutely. The graphics, the graphics on Text Adventures were awesome. Because they're all in your head. <laughs> exactly. The best graphics ever. <laughs> oh man, that's colossal cave. You should have seen that cave. Oh man, it just went on and on. I didn't realize they could do that in a computer game at that time. <laughs> Well, you know, talking about Ron Gilbert as well, tell us about your work on Maniac Mansion. Well, gosh, um, Real Time Associates was hired to do the NES version of Maniac Mansion. One had been done in Japan, but it was kind of a, it was recoding the game from scratch. And for the U.S. release, the publisher wanted something a lot more, um, a lot more authentic. And so we, you know, we were, Real Time Associates was brought in to do the, the conversion, but it, it took a lot of planning um, of how could we make their tool path and their, their scripts and their art actually work on the Nintendo. Uh, if you think about it, the C64 had a lot more resources than, than the 8-bit Nintendo. So it was quite a task, but, but the exciting part about it was that we were using the same game code that they were using. We made a scum, uh, the scum engine. We made an NES scum engine and ran their tools and ran their scripts. And yeah, it took a lot of modifications to make it work in that architecture. And when I look at it now, I realize there's this little scan line hack that we ended up doing to try to split the screen, which was hard to do on the Nintendo. And we should have done a better job of that. But but yeah, we were really putting uh, 50 pounds of potatoes in a five pound bag for that one. Um, yeah, I mean, it re- really pushed that machine to its limits, didn't it? No, uh, yeah, I'll say, and and, and our team. But but it, it, it worked out. Um, there's another story I like on that one, um, which is uh, we sent the game to the, the publisher, which is Jalico, and they played it. And they said, well, where's the music? And he said, well, there's, there's music at the beginning and at the end. Said, no, video games have to have wall-to-wall music. Have you ever played a, a Nintendo game that didn't have music start to finish? So, well, we weren't hired to do that. At the 11th hour, uh, we... We commissioned, this is, uh, by then I'd been working with George Sanger quite a bit, and we commissioned George's team and, and another uh, another musician here in L.A., Dave Hayes, um, to write a handful of songs that we threw in the, the game at, at the last minute. And this is fun for me in that it was using my driver, so I would arrange the music that they were writing, and by that time they were able to write from MIDI. Um, so they'd hand me MIDI compositions, and then I'd wrangle those in and, and uh, hook up instruments and things like that. But... Uh, uh, yeah, that was a, a, a delightful project. Uh, wish we had done more of those scum games. Well, another project that you worked with George Sanger on, and obviously Brian Moriarty, one of my favourite adventure games. You know, I think it's so atmospheric, Loom. And I know the audio was a really big part of that game. What memories mm. have you got of working on Loom? Well, let's see. I, I remember uh, being asked to to do the music for it, but there was a lot of music to do. And at that time, I was uh, working on uh, on a bunch of projects. So uh, for the first time, I really got an audio team together, uh, which uh, w- George ended up doing, I think, all of the high-end arrangements uh, for the MT32, if that's what it was called. And then Dave Hayes, uh, the musician friend here in LA, ended up doing a lot of the PC arrangements, and I might have done the middle ones myself, I forget. Um, but uh, yeah, a, a game that featured music that heavily, it was we were really under the microscope to make sure that everything sounded as good as it possibly could. Uh, and working with Brian, a real delight. Uh, I'm one of the, I'm one of the guys who tried to talk Brian out of using the music from Swan Lake and using uh, original music instead of the stuff from Swan Lake. And he was like, yeah, no. Where are you <laughs> he made the right call there. I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, absolutely. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, like, uh, gosh, well, he loves 2001 The Space Odyssey, so I'll use that reference where Stanley Kubrick had all his classical music in and his rough cuts. And the composer for the, the film was saying, hey, I've got a new scene. I've got, I've got more music. You want to hear it? And he was like, yeah, 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 yeah. And the, <laughs> the studio was, was forcing him down his throat. Look, it's this guy, he, he wrote the music for Spartacus. He's going to be great. Come on, use him. And at the end of the day, Kubrick just ended up using the classical music that he had used in his rough cut. So Brian knew exactly what he was doing. There was no change in that one. Yeah, you've got to stick to your vision sometimes, haven't you? Oh, gosh. I'm, I'm like those. There's uh, plenty of stories. Dom Dagwell might even have one where a lot of people turned down the game Tetris, right? It was shopped around yeah. to 15 or 20 people. So um, it, it's one of my less proud moments, I would say, of trying to talk him out of Swan Lake. <laughs> 
Well, you know, go back to your work on the NES. Um, converting MIDI to the, the NES must have been quite a task. How did you go about solving that? By that time, by the time I was doing 8-bit Nintendo stuff, MIDI equipment was just starting to come on the market. And we developed a MIDI pass-through that would allow a, a keyboard and a sequencer to trigger notes on the Nintendo in real time. So the 8-bit Nintendo became a synthesizer module that you could then uh, do patch changes uh, uh, and uh, note on and note off and, and anything else you might have been able to do in a limited MIDI, MIDI synthesizer. So by that time the music arrangement was really pretty sophisticated. The, the composer or the arranger could hear their song being performed in real time while they were using the machine. Now, MIDI itself was still too large a data format to put in the uh, final product. So I had some post-processors that once we liked the arrangement, I would run the MIDI file through and turn it into much more compressed data statements um, that that would then fit or optimize the space for the platform. Uh, but yeah, by then we were using uh, keyboards and sequencers to uh, to arrange that stuff. So. Well, another NES title that you worked on was um, the license title, The Rocketeer. Did Disney have um, much say on the theme, and what was it like working on a, a Disney property? Yeah, they had a lot of say in that. Um, all of the graphics had to go through them. We would have, I don't know, even monthly reviews. So yeah, it was uh, uh, my, you know, my first exposure to working with a licensee of that, of that level. I think it worked out all, it, you know, eventually it was tougher to get it through Nintendo than it was to get it through Disney because of their licensing standards of, you know, what was acceptable to represent in, in uh, gameplay and what, or, or in uh, graphics and what wasn't. So we'd, we'd submit and send it to Nintendo, and two weeks later they'd say, no, that, that Bulldog Cafe has a, uh, the Bulldog Cafe has a, a pipe. The, you know, this massive 40-foot Bulldog is smoking a pipe made out of a water barrel. And it's part of the national landmark of the thing, but they said, no, nope, no, nope, uh, that's got to go out. So we had, to, you know, we had a couple of false starts in trying to get the um, game through their, their guidelines. Well, I'm not sure how much you know about um, Funhouse over here in the UK. I know, obviously, it was an American TV program first, but here, you know, as, as a kid in the late 80s, Funhouse on ITV, you know, when he got home from school, it was an institution. Every kid watched it. And, you know, hearing the name gives us a massive nostalgia hit. And I know you worked on the, the video game of Funhouse. Were you aware of the UK version and how big it was over here? No, um, no idea whatsoever. Um, the uh, and and um uh, Funhouse was designed by a programmer. Uh, the NES Funhouse was designed by a programmer uh, that I used to work with on on a lot of the NES conversions. And we had a, a cool game mechanic uh, that we were shopping around. And um, I forget how we were introduced. I think it was High Tech Expressions was the publisher, and they might have they might have said, "Hey, can you do a game with Funhouse?" And I said, "Well, I've never seen the TV show, but we've got this game." And then they started to think about it. And, hey, if we adapted the graphics this way and we've adapted the gameplay that way, it might not have been uh, as true to license as the UK version was. Uh, but, um, uh, but yeah, we certainly pulled off a, you know, I consider it to be a, a fun original. Um, but honestly, I'm not sure how well it matched the license. What was the key to doing a good conversion from the NES to the Game Boy and kind of pushing the maximum that you could out of that console? Uh, well, the Game Boy, uh, it, it, like it was a more powerful system, but with less graphics. It even had a, a sound chip that was much better than the, the NES. Uh, but when you've only got those four colors, the real trick was getting the art to read. And then the, it was a smaller display as well. We'd take as much of the design as we could take literally uh, but then mostly it was graphic adaptations. Again, Connie Goldman was still working with me on those, and uh, she's the master of the pixel. So um, you know, I think that once you figure out once you figure out the display capabilities, uh, you you've got half the battle. And then you couldn't really port the code over because it was a different microprocessor. Uh, but we by then we had a very similar engine, and and we'd try to read that if there was a conversion directly that was using like level layouts and things like that, we would uh, use the the uh, gameplay data as literally as we could. 
But you did the Cuba conversion as well for the, the Game Boy. Did you work with Warren Davis on this? No, uh, I didn't. Uh, we did the um, Game Boy Cubert, and then we did the NES, or excuse me, the SNES as well. Uh, for Cubert, we bought the arcade machine and then kind of reverse engineered the gameplay. We figured out how long it took for him to jump from cube to cube. Uh, and then our first pass of the game, we very literally tried to make it as much like the arcade as possible. And the publisher at the time looked at it and said, no, 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 that's the casing for a quarter sucker. That's when you want to get somebody who's, you know, when, when you want to get them hooked after one minute and then make them go, ah, oh, after three minutes uh, and have them throw another quarter in there. That's a completely different pacing than a home version where you don't want to beat somebody up. You want to let them play for a good 20 or 30 minutes. So we completely changed the pacing of the game and the difficulty of the game, recognizing that a casual user didn't want to have to, um, you know, cycle out every four or five minutes. Well, how did you find changing and stepping up Cubert into, you know, Cubert 3, which I know many people consider a much more difficult title than the original? Mm. Uh, well, it was a question of what gameplay mechanics could we add while still staying true to the uh, theme of Cubert. Um, and then um, I had this crazy idea to do these psychedelic uh, background graphics just because we figured out how to do it and there was nothing else going on in the background. And I'm sure a lot of people just turned them off rather than tried to play with all these distracting graphics behind it. But, um, uh, no, we were trying to be as, as true to the original as possible and then coming up with different shaped boards, of course, which we had done on Cubert for Game Boy. So, um, yeah, I think, I think it was still uh, pretty, I, I would say it's closer to Cubert than it, than it deviated from Cubert. Uh, and we ha we had developed an idea for a Cubert adventure, uh, which would have been a more of a, a side-scrolling game, but with the Cubert mechanics, where he was moving through a larger world, predominantly from left to right. Uh, we never got to get that one off the ground. So we had ideas for where we could take the franchise, but uh, never got the opportunity to do it. Well, I know you worked on the Sega Genesis or, you know, Mega Drive, as it was known over here. And that is one of my all-time favorite console sound chips, that Yamaha YM2612. How did you find working on that system and, you know, the audio on that machine? Well, by then, I was producing games more than I was doing the audio for it. Uh, and whereas I had written all of my own audio drivers for the previous consoles, that one was such a significant um such a significant piece of hardware that we've used the Sega supplied tools. So that's the first time when we turn to um, turn to the, the tool chain there. And also by that time I had hired and brought in a composer to work at real time associates um, for me because I didn't have the time. And honestly, composing music is a really labored task for me. And, and to find a musician who can where stuff just comes out fluidly. Um, it was a real, uh, a real treat. So uh, Greg Turner was the guy I had who was doing all the music for most of Real-Time Associates titles during that era. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it was a, a wonderful, wonderful chip. But uh, by then I had distanced myself a little bit from both the hardware and music generation in the first place. I know you produced um, Sega Saturn titles as well. Um, what did you think of that system? And did you have much faith in the Saturn when that launched? Oh, yeah, we were 100% behind the Saturn. Uh, it was a real honor. We were on the Tiger team, which is one of six developers that they had tapped a year before the console was launched to create uh, to create a game. Boy, we were just, uh, I was really happy with that. The, the development systems were horrible. The, the language support was really bad. But hey, I, I programmed an assembly on the, in television, so don't tell me <laughs> something's really hard to use. Um, <laughs> so still uh, very powerful. Um, so that, I think, was probably the one of the heights of creativity, both technically and, and in game design, um, when we were uh, able to create Bug for that. It, it was a difficult system to use, and it had two processors in it. And for our first game for Bug, the first thing the game did was processor number one would turn off processor number two, and then the entire game was written just on processor one. We didn't end up using both the, both the, both the chips in that. Were you disappointed with the way that Sega handled the Saturn? I don't think it was their handling it as much as it was the hardware capabilities. And when the, I remember when the PlayStation dev kits first came, I said, okay, let's write the same piece of code on both machines and see which one outperforms, see how they compare. 
And it was nothing more than a bouncing ball moving around on a screen. And we could get 600 of them on the Saturn and we could get 1800 of them on the, on the PlayStation. And by that time we were so committed to the Saturn. I was like going, Holy smokes. <laughs> uh, this is going to be real tough if we want to uh, make the Saturn look as good as the PlayStation. Cause it, it honestly had literally three times the GPU and, and CPU power. Well, obviously, in the early to mid '90s, the the audio game world was completely changing when full CD soundtracks came in, and video games shifted from being computer generated music to CD soundtracks. How did you feel about that? The transition. Well, I always felt that the the best use of music in a game was interactive, and the guys at Lucasfilm Games took that a lot farther than anybody else did. By then, I wasn't really working with them anymore, but Michael Land and his generation, where they were making the game react to, the, making the music soundtrack react to the decisions of the player. And if you think about the difficulty of not knowing when a canoe is going to hit the shore, but know that you want to have a flowing musical cue when that happens. There's there's all sorts of timing issues in there. So that to me was the holy grail. And you know, what fun is it if you just press start and listen to a piece of music um, if there's nothing really happening that's that's connected to it. So I felt it was a step back. Um, but of course the audio fidelity meant that you could bring in any any musician and any number of synthesizers or <clears throat> an orchestra for that matter. So uh, we ended up supporting that uh, real-time associates just with fully composed, fully realized music. Again, Greg Turner, I think, did a great job on all that stuff. Uh, but but it, it started to disinterest me somewhat because uh, so what? Uh, okay, I might as well get a song and play it. And and where's how is that customized for the game? Now I know that the composers would still try to match the mood and and all of that. But if there was something unique that I brought to uh, game audio, I felt that the introduction of CD to that defeated any contribution I would have um, in that I wasn't so much the, the composer and the, the, the guy in the recording studio with the guitars and, and, and all of that as much as finding the right balance between memory uh, and uh, hardware design. Yeah, and I think as a player, kind of some of the, it kind of felt like some of the skill of composing music for computer games kind of went there because, you know, if you had a an Amiga and a, an Atari ST or you had a Super Nintendo and a Mega Drive, there would often be completely different soundtracks and you knew that the, the people that were working on those were actually working in the limitations of the, the audio chips of those machines. And, you know, it felt like it was a bit more of a skill than just putting something on a CD. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. And even if I think back to Thunder Castle, uh, I was taking classical music that was written for an orchestra with maybe 70 musicians and bringing it, figuring out how I can do that on three channels uh, and still have sound effects interrupt the sound, the, the, the soundtrack, but have the soundtrack keep going. I, I mean, my hat's off to, to musicians in general and anybody who can and write something compelling enough to, oh gosh, I'm in love with World of Warcraft music. Jeez, that's just fantastic. Uh, and, and I'm sure somebody could do a three track takedown of that and and do a good job of it but now i'll listen to the i'll listen to the real thing well socks the cat was an interesting title planned around bill clinton's cat originally meant to be released in 1994 that game originally came out in what well, was meant to be 94 it came out in 2018 in the end <laughs> what was kind of the story with that game <laughs> oh we had to wait for the statute of limitations to run out that's i'm sure that's what it was uh, <laughs> uh, now the uh, the it was a very small publisher, very ambitious, um, but didn't have the financial resources. They they commissioned a, a Genesis game, which was Sox Rocks the House, which took place inside the White House, and then Sox Rocks the Hill, which was us on the um, 16 bit Nintendo. So we didn't have any kind of cross pollination or cross development with them. There's completely different studios doing both games. You know, I'm, I'm, I don't know how well that game would have done in the marketplace. It was so inspired, like, by Doonesbury, or, or it was uh, uh, really, uh, I mean, it was being politically satirical, but I don't think any kids would have gotten any of those jokes. Um, and, and even then, uh, I don't know that, that <laughs> if, if somebody's in the public eye, um, they can be 
uh, you know, done in a political cartoon or something like that, and there's legal precedent for being able to do a cartoon character show of a politician, I don't think anybody had taken it as far to do in a in a video game. So um, maybe we're lucky that it ended up not going. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't call it uh, among our best efforts, but it sure was. Um, I mean, the 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 parody, the level of parody we we're doing in there, I thought was uh, really quite skewering and. Um, when, as I look back at it, I said, gosh, did I really think I would be able to get away with that? <laughs> it was definitely an original idea. And I wonder if maybe there could be more video games based on political cats. We've got Larry the Downing Street cat who's been in a <laughs> residence at 10 Downing Street for over a decade now. So that could be one to consider. <laughs> well, if you just keep well, it, it be the cat, then that, yeah, that'll work. But you're trying to work in the context for it, I think would be the, the trick. And, and it reminded me of a couple of other challenging license adaptations. We did a Beavis and Butthead for the Super Nintendo, uh, but yeah. Beavis and Butthead are so mischievous, and they're dropping bowling balls off of mountains and lighting fires and things like that. And and, uh, and Nintendo's like, no, no, it's got to be entirely family friendly, fun gameplay. Uh, and so to come up with stuff that was mischievous enough to be authentic for the Beavis and Butthead license, but clean enough to match Nintendo, that was the real challenge there. Yeah, I remember back in the nineties, MTV even had to put disclaimers before. Beavis and Butthead saying they're fictional characters, don't do this at home. So yes. that must yeah. have been quite challenging. Um, uh, yeah, it, it was challenging to find the right balance between the two. But uh, and I forget if we even had a disclaimer at the beginning of our game. Well, obviously, you've worked in the games industry for many years. I mean, it's a kind of a, a favorite title, you know, from your past that you've worked on and anything that really you're most proud of them. And why is that? Um, I want to say it's got to be Bug. Um, as because it was one of the first uh, first on the platform, um, it was a genre buster. It wasn't we didn't call it a quad scroller at the time. I heard that used in a review, and I said, "Yeah, that's it. It's not a side scroller. It's a quad scroller." Um, uh, it's use of the hardware, the the, the light hearted characters. Um, wish we had tuned it a bit more, but I'd have to say uh, that was uh, among among my uh, standout titles. If I, if I was going to point a finger at any of them, some other some other stuff I've done more recently. I mean, there's been games with political aspirations or or, or kind of nobler as, aspirations. Remission was a private release game, but it was um, for cancer uh, kids with cancer uh, to keep them up with their treatment regimen. And it was shown in a clinical trial that kids who played Remission took better care of themselves uh, for their treatment than kids who did not which meant that playing this video game actually could improve their healthcare outcome overall. And that's, that was a nice, you know, it, it wasn't so much the game play that I was about, but what we were able to create and how we were able to support the community. Well, I know that Real Time Associates is um, still going strong today. What can we look forward to from you? Is there anything in the pipeline we should be looking out for, Dave? Well, oh, gosh, um, there's a couple of categories. It, our, our, ga- our, our commercial releases, is, it, it's been a few years since our last commercial release. Honestly, I had been working on a, um, a holodeck concept, a location-based holodeck, taking video games uh, and immersing people in them. And I built a prototype using uh, some new hardware that hasn't really hit the market yet. The high concept was if you had your favorite TV uh, game on a favorite TV, big screen TV, you've got a big screen TV in front of you, what would it look like if you poked your head into the TV and then climbed through the TV and were standing in the video game world? And then you had a bunch of your friends come in with you. If you can imagine that being completely immersed or surrounded in an interactive 3D environment. So we got that working. Uh, but the problem with it was that as location-based entertainment, what we required was getting a group of strangers together in a small enclosed space and ask them to interact with one another indoors. Um, so um, a year and a half ago, uh, what well, with the pandemic, we had to shelve that concept for a while. So I've been working on that for maybe four or five years as a location-based mm. video game. And now uh, I, I've been working on some, what you call it holographic telepresence, where we digitize people, transmit them to another location and, and recreate them um, at another place. So it's not, it's using game technology uh, for sure, but it's not necessarily game. Well, Dave, it seems to be a theme in your career over the last four decades that you've always pushed the boundaries of what technology can do and, you know, you're always looking for the next big thing. 
and it's been incredible reminiscing with you over the last hour or so and we can't wait to see what you do next so uh, thank you so much for coming on and sharing some of your stories with us oh well gosh uh, thanks for uh, uh, first of all for the interest and, and for making this uh, available to the community at large I'm just, just always so pleased to hear people who are interested in you know, what where this all came from and, and uh, you know, how it all evolved so glad to contribute and um, thanks for having me on